As Americans, are we just too loud? It's the Bob and Sherry Oddcast. The Bob and Sherry Oddcast. Come on in, you'll have a blast with the Bob and Sherry Oddcast. Bob, before you bring us this, wait, wait, wait. I just want to, everyone, give Doc a round of applause. As painful Uh as it is for him, because he probably can (laughs) sing to try to harmonize with me. He's in there. He's swinging. You know, he's giving it his all. And I I think that should be recognized. I love a challenge. (laughs) <laughs> and it is a that. <laughs> that it is. <laughs> so uh, some people are getting back into traveling. Uh, I'm not going to be doing a lot of it myself this year. I'm just going to, you know, do a little bit, but I'm certainly not going overseas. However, they are welcoming Americans uh, throughout Europe. It's pretty much uh, Greece was like uh, very aggressive with that. And it's pretty much opening slowly. So if people have been thinking of going there, um, there are a million articles about there about going to Europe that you may want to peruse. I looked at one just because it looked like fun. It was this is what Americans need to realize when they come to Europe. And some of it's pretty snarky. But one of the things really jumped out at me. And I'll tell you what that is in just a minute. Um, A couple of the things are uh, England is not just London. It has many interesting towns throughout the country. Another one was uh, there's more to Germany than just celebrating, you know, the obvious uh, beer celebrations, the Oktoberfest and all of that. And Germany, it's um, also not a good idea to do try a certain accent to just be funny. I know that from personal experience. I was in uh, a beer hall where the uh, putsch took place with Hitler, where he where he started his career publicly. And I, I had a couple of beers and I was saying to a couple of friends of mine, well, perhaps. Then this German guy looked over at me right away and took his finger and went, no, no, no. No, 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 don't do that. So you do have to kind of be aware that you don't want to come across as the ugly American. In, um, where is it, Amsterdam, they say, please realize there's more to our city than prostitutes and weed. In fact, we don't even smoke that much weed here. And the red light district is sort of being not shut down, but it's being gentrified and, and pushed away. And and the thing that jumped out at me, I forget which country this person was from. I don't want to think, from, I think it was England. They said, why are you so loud? Why are Americans so loud? Do you think, I mean, do you think as a country we're louder than I think so, like yeah. the, the Belgian people or the Italians or yeah. the Swiss. And you know why? I think there's a really um, Tell me. simple explanation for it. And it, it reminds me there's a passage in a Thomas Wolfe book that really hits this home. So Americans are so big and loud and expansive and expressive because we've always had so much land and space and room to be that way. I um, think so. European um, cultures and countries, you know, they tend to be yeah. much more, they're smaller. I mean, Bel- we could fit Belgium into, you know, a state, any of our states, right? So they tend to be smaller. People live more closely together, more collectively. They yeah. don't have the enormous expanse of frontier that Americans have always had. So we right. we come from a land where you can spread out and stretch your arms and shout your voice because you just geographically and physically can. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's true. But then again, in the Munich Beer Hall that I was referring to, um, it's enormous and it's as loud as can be. And the beer uh, waitresses are carrying these giant steins and they're rattling against them. And there's like each each waitress has like six in her arms and, pe- and then there's a band playing it all. So it's not like they're very suddenly. I I just think that they notice us maybe on the streets where we're yelling for a family member to, you know, we're going over this way now. Um, I'm trying to think if I can remember other uh, people that I've noticed from different countries being loud like that. Mary and I were in Banff and there were a lot of Asian tourists there and they seemed pretty loud. 
I have to say, Bob, that you were in a German beer hall doing your worst Hogan's Heroes impersonation. Maybe it was more that than the volume of it. Let's yeah. um, let's pause here. Let's come back with this because I think it is interesting that we are so much more loud and physically expressive, you know, throwing ourselves mm-hmm. around through space. We'll be right mm-hmm. back. Do you own or rent your home? Well, sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work, but you know what's easy? Bundling policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Do you own or rent your home? Well, sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. But you know what's easy? Bundling policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Not everybody can go to Europe. It is expensive, but we're talking about that today because it has opened back up for American tourists who did not go last year. And it really caused a lot of havoc in the travel industry, which is very important in European countries. And we were talking about an article I read that said, why are you Americans so loud? (laughs) And we're trying to figure out if we really are louder than other societies. I mean, I, I picture the Australians being pretty bawdy, you know? pretty pretty outspoken right yes but um and and i think i i think it's unfair to say that we are the loudest and the you know the bossiest or the noisiest i think that's an unfair thing to say of us but if you think about american culture like we are loud and rowdy and we feel we feel entitled to take up space in in a way that's kind of uniquely American. I'm not saying that as a criticism. Um, think about, think about how much, uh, and don't always use yourself as the example, you know, think about all of us, how we feel like that's my seat and I'm going to sit there. That's my hotel and I'm going to be there. Like we feel that when we are in a place that it's our place to dominate and control. Yeah, I do think that there's some resentment about that. One of the other things was, um, if you're coming to our country, I think this was Italian, at least learn a little bit, uh, a few things. Please don't assume that everybody speaks English. Now, a lot of people speak English all around the world, but especially in Europe. Outside of the language of that country, English is is the, the most spoken language in all of those countries. Um, you know, this was one of the reasons why when I sent my kids to uh, the language immersion magnet school, it, I thought, you know, what a cool gift to have uh, yeah. because most of us only speak English. Mm-hmm. Um, what a cool, cool gift to have that you would have this ability to communicate with um, other people anywhere right. you go. The, the reason that people in other countries speak English is because from the time they're children, they're taught it in school. Like, right. not to be, you know, not to be an American going, it's not fair. They didn't teach us in school. The average American gets two years of French or Spanish in 10th grade. It's kind of late, right? And that's it. Yeah, you're right. Um, I found right. that, um, I found that uh, quote that, um, that Thomas uh, Wolf had. It's from Look Homeward Angel. And he's talking about the vastness of America, like, this country, it's so huge. It's enormous. Think about your forefathers and foremothers who emigrated here from Ireland and Norway and Germany and England and Denmark and and uh, um, Belgium and wherever, right? All these, this wave of these Europe, Poland, these European immigrants that came to America and found themselves face to face with the immensity of it, just the sheer staggering, unknowable immensity of America. And in oh, the right. Angel, yeah. Thomas Wolfe is talking about the vastness of the country. And he yeah. said, this is the reason, this is this terrible hunger that haunts and hurts Americans and makes us exiles at home and strangers wherever we go. It, it, we're shaped by the land. And how could we not be? Right. If you grow well, up on an island, you're shaped by that 
um, vast, uh, the ring of water, you know, and the, the inability to bridge those distances. You're shaped by geography and we're shaped by geography. I, you know, I hate the stereotype of the ugly American because I think it's unfair to so many Americans who travel around the world. Um, and, and I hate that. I hate that we are classified as loud and vulgar and crude when sometimes we're loud and enthusiastic and not mindful of how loud and enthusiastic we are. I think that's part of it. You know, you're talking about the immensity of uh, America, just the territory alone. But there are so many other things that are just plain bigger in America and always have been than the rest of the world. Uh, First and foremost, cars. Up until recently, the American, they called them Yank Tanks in Australia. When you look back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even the 80s, these amazing giant American cars, if you compared the average European car to it, it looks like a golf cart, you know? So we're used to big things like that. If, if You remember the, uh, the old movie uh, Urban Cowboy? And, yeah. and so uh, there's that bar scene in Mickey Gilly's Bar in Houston, which actually exists. And the bar itself is enormous. You just don't picture a country bar or any kind of a bar that big in uh, in Belgium. You, you, you just it's just American where they you know guys are doing a cowboy line dances and and drinking beers at multiple bars within one place. It, that is that is part of the bigness of America. Well, think about, okay, so the big American cars, because we had big American driveways and our big home, suburban homes and our big neighborhoods, and we had big sprawling interstates that you, that were yeah. designed to land an airplane on, and you could get into your big American car and fill that gas tank, and you could start in New York, and you could drive all the way to California, and it would take you days and days and days, and you would cross every kind of imaginable terrain, and your mind would be blown by how much of the country seemed utterly and completely empty. That is an experience that makes no sense in a small village in Ireland or Scotland or, or freak, Belgium, the whole country, right? It, that made us in part the way we are. It made us, when you have everything like that, when you have all that bigness, you know, your arms open wide and you just want to scoop up even more. And of course and, you're going to be words. loud. We've always been such a competitive uh, nation. I mean, not just with the world, but with one another. I mean, it doesn't get any more competitive. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. New York, New York, right? Um, And so yelling for taxi cabs, um, yelling for what kind of a sandwich you want at, at uh, at a deli in New York, I think is also part of just how we became as a country. You don't picture, even in a city as big as London, you don't picture that kind of yelling for uh, your pastrami order in in London. So I have a friend who um, is Irish. She came to America um, to work as a school teacher when she was like 23. And she came from a big, big family. I think she's one of six kids and I've actually visited, she, she took me home to visit her family in Cork and they mm-hmm. lived, on, you know, on a little tiny um, bit of land in a village that was pretty small population wise, um, just outside the city. And so she came to America and the first place she lived was Nashville, Tennessee. She's working as a school teacher and she's reading the newspaper one day and there's an ad for a land auction. And the land was selling. It was dirt cheap. And she couldn't believe her eyes because in Ireland, land is really expensive. And here's why. There's not much of it. So she thought it was a misprint. She looks and she's like, this can't be right. Now, she's a school teacher. She's 20 something. She's got no money. And she's a brand new arrival on our shores. But she does have a MasterCard. And so she calls the land auction people and in her beautiful lilting Irish accent asks if, if she comes to the auction, do they accept credit cards? And they said, yeah, sure. Okay. We accept credit cards, personal checks and cash. Right. So she goes to the land auction and they're selling off parcels of land and she cannot believe 
how cheap this land is. Now, I don't know anything about the patch of land that she bought. I can't tell you, you know, is it radioactive I'm, or spiders? I have no idea. But she was so amazed that you could buy land for that little bit of money on a credit card that she held up her hand and she bid on a couple of acres and she got it, put it on the credit card. It took her about five years of scrimping and saving to even begin to start paying it down. But she said to me, I went home that day and I thought, I own a bit of American land now. Oh. And she drove, she got into her little car. When she came here, she bought like a little used car. She got into her little car and she drove out and she found her land and she walked the perimeter of it and she sat down in the grass and she took pictures of it and she looked at it and looked at it and looked at it and could not believe that she owned some land. And she got bit by the bug, by that American bug. And she began saving and saving. And she went to another auction and bought a little more land. And then she moved and bought a little more land. And now she's a pretty experienced school teacher and she's got visions for the future. So she founded her own school. And at first oh, it was wow. just little kids. It was, you know, preschool and kindergarten and all that. And then mm -hmm. she grew it to elementary. And then eventually she added middle school and eventually she added high school. And today she is uh, living in Florida with her husband and family. And she came to this country with nothing but a teacher's degree. And today she is a completely self-made, um, naturalized American who owns land in a handful of states and cannot believe the glorious good fortune that she had when she arrived here. Isn't her, that great? The thing that always struck me wasn't just her incredible, you know, success story. When she first told me this, her passion for owning a piece of land was something that I had never come across before in, mm -hmm. in anyone I'd ever met. You know, we talk about, oh, I'm going to buy a house someday or whatever. <clears throat> the soil, she owned a handful of American soil and it was the beginning of everything for her. So as Americans, we don't necessarily understand how much we have. We can be we can be, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like we can be spendthrifts and profligate and wasteful because there's just so much of it. But for um, Europeans, it's scarce and precious and you're lucky to have any of it. And you can just go ahead and dream about getting more because there's so little of it to go around. And that's you why know, I think we're so big and loud. Speaking of coming to this country, this is a, a, off of the subject somewhat that we're talking about, but um, I was in a restaurant with Mary and 60 Minutes was up on the uh, television screen and the sound was down. And the first thing was about the Mars rover. And then the second piece, there was an elderly man in a bright pink sport jacket. And then all of a sudden he was um, talking about black and white footage of the Nazis in Germany. And it went on for two segments. It, it, it was the rest of 60 minutes. And I'm looking at it. And the guy next to me is looking at it, too. And I said, do you know what's going on with this? And he said, I think that man is an Auschwitz um, uh, survivor. And so I said, well, I'm going to watch that. So last night, I pulled up 60 minutes and I watched the two pieces. This guy is 99 years old. He's, he's going to be 100 this year. He did survive a death camp. And here's how he survived it. There were four people in his family. They decided that they wanted to get the hell out because they were German Jews. They wanted to get out. And so they, the whole family, they wouldn't allow all of them to leave, only one. And so they sent him. And he left by himself at the age of 12, went over in a boat, landed on Ellis Island, and then in lower Manhattan, and was met by an uncle and taken in. Um, very, very sad. The three members of his family uh, and his grandparents were killed by the Nazis in death camps. Mm -hmm. So he starts studying and he gets into Harvard and he's brilliant. And he, of course, knows German. He's so angry at the Nazis that he joins at the age, uh, even though he was in, I think he was in Harvard, he quits moment uh, for a while and joins the U.S. Army to go kill Nazis. And they interview him, the army does, and says, you know languages. 
they combined him along with about 20 other guys, 20, 30 other guys in a uh, fort, and they did nothing but train them on how to interrogate captured Nazis because they spoke the language and they knew the nuance. And they became so good at bringing out information from these Nazis that, I mean, big time, they helped to win the war. And he was under fire. These other men were under fire. It was the most amazing story. It's never been told before because this particular unit was kept under wraps until like 2010. But now people are talking about it. And guess who one of the other guys was who was one of these um, people who could talk to Germans? I, David, I, all David Rockefeller. David Rockefeller. As you're describing David this, I'm like, what a movie this would be. Totally. And- I, and that's need, what I was thinking. We need the guys from Inglorious Bastards. We need Brad Pitt and his Nazi hunters yeah. to come in and be in yeah. this movie. This how has this never been made into a movie? I know because it's it's been under wraps. It's got to got to be a movie now. But my point to the whole thing is: here's somebody who came as a 12 year old and could not speak English, and he ends up. Long story short, an officer in the United States Army, and then he teaches at I. It's either Harvard or, or one of the Ivy League schools. And many of these men also taught at uh, at Ivy League schools and became great scientists. So, you know, look, uh, no, nothing say, is perfect. Nothing is perfect. But right. this country has been um, something remarkable in the course of human history, for sure. And that's what he said. He said he wanted to go and fight. Because he appreciated being an American so much. So if you haven't seen bit, it, it's on sixty minutes, and you can sixty minutes can be pulled up anywhere. We're a little bit loud, you know, and right. we're a little bit messy. And sometimes we show up at a tourist site in Rome wearing a T-shirt that says "Ask me for a mustache ride" or whatever, you know. But we're at our heart, I think we're decent people, and we're hospitable people. And we're kind. And it's easy to forget the core essential goodness of Americans if the only right. version of America you see is on like social media, right. which is um, a sewer, not not that much less gross than the bathroom my daughters share. I mean, it's disgusting. But it doesn't, it's not a true mirror. It's a really distorted mirror to who we are. I still, I still think that when you scrape that away, you find some loud, friendly, goofy, generous people that um, are glad to have you here. And you know where you're appreciated as an American? I've read this time and time again, and I've heard it from people who have been there. And the town of Normandy in France, they will come up to Americans and say, thank you. Well, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not all bad. No. It's just... I have to say, I, I mean, I just have to say that social media has been, and the internet, it was supposed to be so awesome. God, it was intended to be awesome. Um, it, we're in a period of time where the, the ugliest and most hateful and most toxic tends to get the biggest spotlight, but it's not who we really are. It's not. It's an, it's an amazing thing where you can just, you know, type right in there and um, a lot of the world's knowledge is available right in your hand. I mean, it really is. You have, you have uh, something that's uh, eluding you, something in math, and you can type it right in and there's the answer right there. And then you can find the most toxic, miserable, horrible people uh, just saying terrible things about one another. It's, it's the trade-off. Right? I can promise trade-off. you. That even if you went to a website right now where you got help with your math, don't look at the comments section. Don't no. look at it. Because no. three down, it'll be, fuck you for not knowing how to do math, you <laughs> yeah, chuckle that's nuts. Right. That's right. <sighs> that's it that's for today's right. Oddcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We have new episodes for you every Monday and every Friday. Check out Fun Size. It's hosted by our director, Max. It's about 10 minutes long. Snack size, perfect for sharing, and a big old grab of the best moments of the regular Bob and Sherry show. Our website is B-O-B-A-N-D-S-H-E-R-I.com. Love to hear from you. 
love to get your feedback, especially, you know, since we don't have as many middle managers yelling at us as we once did. And um, if you would like to join us on the Oddcast, because there's something really fascinating about you that the world needs to hear, drop us a line at bobandsherry.com. We'll see you next time on the Oddcast. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the Bob and Sherry podcast and the Bob and Sherry Oddcast. We would love if you would subscribe, rate and review and share it with a friend on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you go. And thank you again for listening.